Hello, welcome to Live at the Library. I'm Clay Smith. I'm the new literary director at the Library of Congress. This is my first event uh, as a literary director. You know, I like whenever I've done something the first time in my life, like a chandelier has fallen or you know something awful has happened. It's been a real Wiley E. Coyote and um, Roadrunner situation. So, just hope everything works out tonight. Uh, thank you for being here. Live at the Library is a new series of events that happen every Thursday night from 5 to 8 p.m. Uh, we're just opening up the library, uh, especially this Jefferson building, our most iconic building. Uh, and it's always from 5 to 8 p.m. There's something every Thursday that is different. We've done um, a dance party when our poet laureate, uh, Joy Harjo, ended her term two weeks ago. That was pretty fun. So uh, we just want to invite you to experience the richness of our collections and all the many, many ideas that are housed here at the library. So we hope you come back. Uh, let me mention a few of the upcoming Live at the Library events. Uh, if you didn't check out the Abraham, Abraham Lincoln uh, display, we've brought out some special Lincoln uh, items. They are um, in uh, the, uh, the other side of Jefferson here, uh, so check those out, they're pretty cool. On Ju June 9th, we are featuring Washington journalist and um, pundit James Kirchick, and he is the author of a new book called Secret City, The Hidden History of Gay Washington, and he will be in conversation with uh, Washington Post writer Jonathan Capehart. It's an 800-page book, lots of hidden gay history in Washington, so... Uh, that one should be interesting. Uh, and then on June 16th, we are celebrating Juneteenth a few days early with um, the Grammy Award winners, Ranky Tanky. We're gonna have a concert from them. On June 23rd, photographer Annie Leibovitz will be here uh, talking about her latest book, which is a collection of her fashion photography um, all during her long career. Uh, and on June 30th, Washington Nationals pitcher Sean Doolittle We'll talk with the Librarian of Congress, Dr. Carla Hayden. Uh, he is the pitcher for the Nationals, but also like a really excellent reader. So uh, that'll be an interesting conversation. So I'm really um, thrilled to be in conversation tonight with Joy Williams. Let me tell you a little bit about her. She, her most recent novel is Harrow. You may have it. You may have already read it. Uh, she's the author of four previous novels, including The Quick and the Dead, which was a runner-up for, for the Pulitzer Prize, and also the author of four collections of stories, as well as Ill Nature, a book of essays that was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award. A.O. Scott, the New York Times critic, uh, has written that Joy, quote, practices camouflage, except that instead of adapting to its environment, Williams's imagination by remaining true to itself, reveals new colorations in the ecology around her. Among her many honors are the Rhea Award for the short story and the Strauss Living Award from the American Academy of Arts and Letters. She was elected to the Academy in 2008, and she has been the recipient of the Library of Congress Prize for American Fiction for the past year, and uh, she is unfortunately ending her term tonight with this event, and we will be announcing soon uh, who the next Library of Congress Prize for American Fiction recipi recipient is going to be. So stay tuned for that. We um, decided for the uh, Prize for American Fiction winner's um, last event with us that we would ask that writer to talk about any topic in fiction that interests her. Um, and so tonight, Joy is gonna talk a little bit about what the novel needs to do in the future and what that future might look like. And after she's done with her talk, I'll ask her a few questions, and uh, we'll have time for you all to ask your questions. So be thinking of your questions, and uh, signed copies of Harrow are available for purchase in our gift store um, in this building. And uh, we're honored Joy is here with us tonight, and let's welcome Joy. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being here. And uh, I prepared a few. 
pages. <laughs> um, I titled this Reckoning. I began thinking about this little piece as a manifesto. Immediately, I reconsidered. For a manifest is doughy, unbaked, meant to be overbaked, codifies. Still, I wanted a form that could contain my belief that the novel and her moody sibling, the short story, which has always been more attuned to the essential and ineffable, is poised in this time of environmental Armageddon to become relevant. The alternative, of course, is to become increasingly irrelevant. The novel is the most puffed up of the arts, the most exalted, the furthest from perfecting a form. It was Randall Jarrell who described it as a prose narrative of some length with something wrong with it. Henry James described novels as large, loose, baggy monsters, but he was referring dismissively to the 19th century ones. The 20th century effort was modernism, and we all know what that was which morphed into a noirly urban fretting prior to slipping into a brief minimalism that relied a great deal on society's glut, excess, and self-regard before veering into a woozy decadence of madcap neurosis, freewheeling, freewheeling assertiveness, and play, play, play. That was postmodernism, and we know what that was too, a sugar high followed by exhaustion. Of course there were exceptions, there are always great exceptions. For fiction has large powers, it can change our thinking on a more profound level than journalism or nonfiction, certainly more than confessional writing. It can be more haunting and alluring, more metaphysically disruptive. Yet well into the 21st century, fiction continues to suffer from postmodern hangover and has become more than a little slack, feverish, self-involved, overly intimate, mired more than ever in human needs and wants and emotional health. Dissecting the private realm of the self and sharing it with others has become the most comfortable of comfort zones. It is perhaps just the stage, a last deflection, an indulgence before literature leaps into the reckoning. For leap into the reckoning, literature must. There is a hint of activity on the room at the edge of this reckoning, a vague accountability, some modest venturing into new themes and methods. Yet the majority of writers remain cautious of challenging the majority of readers who prefer reading solely about the adventure of being human. And it could be said that even among those currently muddling about the edge, there is more opportunism than daring. Our dying earth can contribute to the plot, even highlight the fortitude or distress of compelling characters. The human predicament remains paramount. Publishing has already put this tendency into a category and given it a name, cli-fi, where our inevitably horrid environmental future has been accomplished but continues to be confronted by human pluck and ingenuity. There is also the more earnest eco-lit which is more dismayed, nostalgic, and critical. This too has been brought into the fold of corporate acceptance, which has briskly moved to preempt the plaintive message, codify it, and place it in a minor niche. This message, the message of ecocide, has been delivered again and again. It's rather old news, and we have been receiving it for some time the highly edited version being, we have messed up the earth. Our stewardship has been spotty at best. Henceforth, our lives will be different, perhaps unpleasantly so. This assumes that lives will continue to be lived, but with fewer animals, companion or otherwise, weirder looking sunsets, 
and decidedly discouraging sunrises. Less edited it is, we have salted the earth and become unworthy of her wonders. We have crushed her wonders. What we broke is what you've bought and you can't return it. We can't replace it either. It's not being offered anymore. At a stretch, this suggests that something will continue to be offered, something we have been primed to receive. Let the dead bury the dead, as it were. We live in a vaingloriously individualistic but poor corporate age, and we have been convinced that this is a compatible pairing. Technology is capable of fixing what really matters, and tech has gotten better at making words mean something different than they once did. Take the word stream. It no longer evokes the image of fresh flowing water, does it? Meanwhile, we can more or less continue to do what we've been doing and want to do, build, consume, raise, procreate, take and have, have and take, more, repeat. As a character in Don DeLillo's Zero K says, everyone wants to own the end of the world. What has been lost has become more irretrievable and irreversible by the day as it proceeds from being lost to being gone forever. Simultaneously, our actions, or the actions of those who claim to speak for us, continue to be irresponsible, and irredeemable. These are the four frightful eyes of our time. Irretrievable, irreversible, irresponsible, irredeemable. Stampeding towards us on pale horses bearing the deathly flag of message. And we know, we know, we've heard it, seen it, felt it, and we feel we're dwelling on it far too much. Dwelling on the inevitable is not the way of humankind. It's unhealthy. We can't allow ourselves to be defeated by this new inevitable. And it's important that our children not be defeated either. Important that they develop the right attitude. Our recent task force recommended that children eight and over should be screened for anxiety. If they are found to be overly anxious, we're assured that some anxiety is perfectly normal. Psychotherapy is advised. If that proves unhelpful, drugs might be necessary, carefully vetted and approved, of course. Psychotherapy, drugs, technology, engineering, re-engineering. Flexibility is the key, adaptation, invention. There is still more to be tapped, harvested, utilized, stored. Mistakes have been made, admittedly. The construction of massive dams, for example. Those engineers were so proud. But that's how we learn. Surely there must be something more to exploit to keep us going. The end of the line need not be the end. Think enjambment. Or think we still have time, but the window's closing. Or think who needs the window anyway? Maybe there is no window. So. The message has been received, and our reaction has become increasingly chaotic regarding it. Our minds sink and stall. We bray and posture and deflect. No wonder eight and over and under feel anxiety and despair. And what of the anxiety and despair of animals, our fellow beings, trapped in wet markets or fattening pens or zoos or dwindling habitats or polluted skies or oceans? Perhaps there's another word for what they feel, or larger words, ones that truly indicate the sorrow, the horror of their situation. For we need such words that bond with others in holier and more enlivening ways, like those molecules essential to life, words that impact us in fresh ways, that reach us on different levels of awareness. We must find another way of being in this world. We must take up a different practice of being. Proceed like someone learning to skate 
who practices where it is dangerous and has been forbidden. I am twisting ever so slightly some lines of Kafka here, but why not? He remains unassailable in questioning our incomprehension. He was speaking here of someone pursuing facts, but it could be similarly said of someone who pursues truth. For truth is dangerous and ruthless, are the forces arrayed against those naive enough to seek it. Joseph Brodsky said, should the truth about the world exist, it's bound to be non-human. Even riskier than as we proceed, as we skate on the ice of nothingness, the truth does not lie within, but outside ourselves. And how, with the limitations of our all too human intelligence, can we know it? Better to think it doesn't exist. Or if it does, is it relevant to our survival, our dominance? We still seem stuck in the human is the pinnacle of all creation groove. It all goes round and round. Our evasive reasoning fueled by hopes and fears and distorted pride, our excessive habits of being. Art alone can free us from these habits. Fiction's art, an unmessaged, transformative art of conscience and daring, which will acknowledge the holy, seek it without shame. Like Kafka Skater, we must practice in unfamiliar, inhuman spaces, practice a more demanding and as yet unrecognizable awareness, practice recognitions, practice as in the beautiful line of Wendell Berry's resurrection. Perhaps there are the makings here of an immodest manifesto, a declaration of aims and approach, a brief if partial list of fiction's responsibilities as she confronts the reckoning with the expectation that she has the power to effect deep change. For one, fiction is not entertainment. And for two, Fiction denies the false assurances of narrative. Government, corporations, and mass media now own, shape, and manipulate the myth of the arc of progress of narrative. These are no longer the wellsprings of fiction. Number three, fiction avows that consumerism is violence. Consumerism is terrorism. It is not an amusingly eccentric aspect of human nature. The objects of our satire are murdering us. Number four, fiction considers the non-human animal as worthy of attention and care as the human one. Number five, the human song that is fiction is gravely aware that the Earth's song is being extinguished. The writing of fiction and its unusual symbiosis with the reader is instrumental in reviving the wondrous song of the living earth. Number six, fiction will energize the word, thwart conditioned reaction and expectation, invite a new gnosis, and offer a path away from the dead end of the self. There. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was great. Um, dark, but great. <laughs> so. That's me. <laughs> well, <laughs> the dark part. <laughs> um, so let me ask you, I mean, you, you alluded it to one of your sort of the later um, statements that you made toward the end of your talk. But I mean, what do, do you think that fiction has a, um, as a way to change our relationship with nature outside of the pages of a book? You know, should, should someone read a work of fiction that, I mean, you, you referred to several different kinds, eco-lit, um, cli-fi. Um, <laughs> sh should, should those kinds of narratives um, try 
to convince us to live well, differently? Well, that, that's the oddness of this. Yeah. I mean, fiction should never have a message in the short story. This is what I learned as a tiny child, right? You can't, you can't have a message in what you write about. I mean, yeah. and so, yes, it's a messageless uh, attempt at, at just changing our entire, our, our entire attitude. It's, uh, um, Thomas Berry mentioned it's a great, the great work. He did this in 19... Do, are you familiar with that work? He was a Catholic theologian. It was, what, 99 or 98? Maybe even earlier than that. And that's 20 years ago now, more than 20 years ago. And people have been giving us the message for a long time, but he said the great work was to transform ourselves, to transform what it means to be human, to mm -hmm. extend uh, this adventure that we've, you know, just about terminated into uh, what's left of the world. And um, so, no, I don't, I don't think, <laughs> I don't think the new fiction should be a message. Clearly, mm -hmm. people have received it or dismiss it or, but it's a way of dealing with words and, uh, and, and, and lives and reading, what reading means that is, will be transformative. In, in some way I cannot, <laughs> you know, give you perfect examples of. Right. But, but I, I do think fiction is on the verge, or should be on the verge of, of really being t totally different. It's a different kind of, um, not lesson or message, about how to interact with the world and how to treat the world, but it's a, it's a, it offers, you know, it has a unique power to, to get people to think about themselves in relation to, to the world. And I love that you use this phrase, old news, for, you know, what we call climate change. I mean, when you turn on the TV and there's a freaky storm, uh, like, uh, you know, south of Denver, <laughs> it's, supposed to it's, get, always yeah, it's supposed to get like eight inches of snow this weekend. And, you know, what, what, when, if you watch the, the local broadcast news at night, they, the weatherman makes a sort of special effort to drive home the point without really saying it that this is due to, to climate change. I think, I'm assuming in the idea that he or she could still convince a few more people <laughs> that that climate change is real, but, but that, I'm so, I, I believe him, but I'm so tired of that kind of message. And so right, I just loved right, it that right. you called it old news because fiction does have this power to get us think in a new way about this. Um, and it's also evasive and just, you know, I mean, fiction, it's, we, can, we can do so much. And yeah. This is so crucial. I mean, I'm, I'm really amazed that there hasn't been a bigger, uh, Mm -hmm. um, shift to really writing about something that matters very much about the human spirit of the soul or how we, how we, how we live on this planet. Yeah. But I love that you um, called the short story the Moody Sibling. Yeah, I think <laughs> it is the Moody Sibling. I love that form. Um, the short story. Well, I, I watched your video from um, when, you, when you began being the um, Prize for American Fiction honoree, and you were very clear in that interview that you prefer the short story, and of course your most recent book is a novel. Um, so, I mean, tell us a little bit about your work as an artist. I mean, is it, do, do you find it easy to move between short story and novel? Oh, no, I find everything <clears throat> incredibly difficult, but and a novel is just, I've written several of them, as you mentioned, but I, I still have no, no idea of how it's done. And, and the short story is always more familiar and... Uh, and you've taught uh -huh. fiction, so... Right, right. <laughs> but... And I'm, I mean, the American short story is in, is in good shape, I think. I mean, I think we still respect it in this country, I don't know about, but uh, I think it has, it can pack a tremendous wallop and uh, be very memorable. And I don't know why some people don't. I mean, you hear people say, well, people say that about poetry too. I don't, I don't like poetry or mm. I don't, I just don't like the short story, you know, I just, but that's yeah. incomprehensible to me because I think it's just such a, a, a wonderful and powerful form. 
You, you said something in that previous interview about the short story, you have to know right away who you're writing about and, and to sort of feel the character is what I was taking from what you were saying. I said that? Well, you, <laughs> you said, yeah, you did. Um, I mean. So in the novel, I mean, for example, in Harrow, you have this sort of, it's a short um, prologue and then you sort of get into the story proper, I guess. Did, is, do you find it sort of harder in the novel form to warm up to the, what, what you're sort of committing yourself to if, if writing is difficult for you? Oh, yeah, and what I have found, and I think <clears throat> some novelists might feel that too, is uh, you just bring in another character. You, uh, I think Virginia Woolf said something about just throwing more twigs on the fire or something when you, when you stall, and so you just, and sometimes it really helps and is wonderful, and they save your book for you. And other times it's just, no, 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 and then you have to write them out again or something. Uh. <laughs> do you, do you, I mean, you've done, you have had four novels and a number of short story collections. Are you still writing characters out? Like, is, is that frustrating to you to have to remove them after the work that you've done on those pages? Am I still doing I'm what? What's Removing, you, you just mentioned sort of having to remove a character. Oh, no, no, I don't do that with short stories. When, mm -hmm. they, when they appear early on, they stay. I mean, they insist upon it or they make me work for it. They, they will not be dismissed easily. Yeah. You know? So, so you, you called the talk at first um, not really a manifesto and then you questioned yourself. I mean, are Let's say that everyone in the room agreed with you. That <laughs> I don't think they do. <laughs> Let's say that they did, and there, we all agree there should be more fiction that you know, compels the reader to, to question his or her relationship to the natural world. How, how, how do we affect that? I mean, one of the things I heard in what you were saying is that fiction, um, where I just was taking notes, um, there's more opportunism than daring in current fiction, how, basically how do we... I, I just meant by that it's, it's going back to just the human dilemma, you know? Uh, mm -hmm. Grandpa's got cardiac disease and grandma's, you know, and yet the, 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 the fracking interests want to buy and yet they need the money to take care of, you know, and it's all just, it's reduced to something that is kind of, yeah. Uh, uh, into a, into a, into a controllable narrative or feeling, and it, it, some some of this can be very moving, but it doesn't really address the essential. We have to change. Mm -hmm. I mean, dramatically. Yeah. And uh, it, it can be done in an, a, a number of ways. Just more daring with the language, or. Uh, not being so comfortable in just, you know, characterizations or mm -hmm. the confines of plot. Yeah. Uh, and, and so that this would reach us in different, in different ways. Yeah. I mean, the old ways are not... not Do you, I mean, it strikes me that if we had... If we encouraged editors at publishing houses to inspire what, their what writers to be more daring... <laughs> I don't, I don't instead know. of make me more money that that might be one avenue to 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 get this kind of fiction out there that's really much more thoughtful fiction do you in your relationship with your editor do you, do you find that your editor is um, sort of inspiring you and giving you new ideas and sort of encouraging you to be um, bold in your fiction or do you kind of just find that within yourself because every writer has a different kind of relationship to their Editor. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, much younger writers um, have have really sisterly relationships <laughs> with their with their uh, agents or editors, and I've never found that anybody really has <laughs> you know, has uh, either helped helped me much or wanted to to to, to guide me much. I, I remember early on with with. Harrow, and I might have mentioned this before, my editor at the time at Knopp, um, 
just said, uh, I, I, you know, is this, what is this character? Is she, is she, yeah, I said, she's dead, she's dead. And he said, I don't want to read a novel about, and I think it's been done before, I'm sorry, I think novels about dead people have been, you know, it's not. Or told by dead. Uh, told by, but, uh, and he just was very stubborn about this. And I said, okay, well, we don't really have to say that she's dead dead, but there's curiously a, uh, something is amiss <laughs> in, in the life she is living. Yeah. And I just could not let that, I, I couldn't let that go. I mean, that really was so important to, to the book. And uh, uh, I don't know, I'm, you probably know much more about, you know, publishing and what, what is in demand. And I don't think the writers can uh, really steer that so much unless there's a great wave of <laughs> doing the work mm -hmm. that makes them, well, if you want to you want to publish literary fiction, it's got to be a little, you know, calibrated differently. Mm -hmm. I have one more question and then we'll open it up to questions from everybody here. I want to ask you about The Handmaid's Tale because it, you know, it was published a while ago, but of course, now with the TV show and the, the sales increased of The Handmaid's Tale so much, and I think it's in its sixth season now on Hulu. Um, you know, the, the, the catchphrase for that novel that I think when it was first published probably was called Prescient is now called um, Prescient. Like, like she, she saw what was coming, especially if Roe v. Wade go, is overturned, as we think it will be. Mm -hmm. And so it's just fiction as sort of um, soothsayer or sort of like forecasting doom. What, you know, how, how do we make sure that fiction of the kind that you're talking about tonight um, doesn't, isn't that same kind of doomsayer fiction? You know, that, that, that there is some hope, I guess, is what I'm saying. Can, can fiction about our relationship to the natural world, even though we're clearly not, we don't have a healthy relationship with the natural world, can that fiction still have some kind of hope? Oh, I think so. If the, if the work is, <laughs> the great work, I keep, I, ju I just can't get over it. I wrote, I wrote essays, a collection of essays called Ill Nature. Yeah. When was that? Was so long ago. It was, uh, and, the things I've been writing about, you know, about, about, about hunting or development or whatever, it's still there and it still is kind of fresh because people still aren't understanding this on some mm -hmm. deeper, deeper level. And uh, I don't think the prescience now is so much. We are living in, I, I don't know what we're living in. I, maybe we are living in sort of an after death, but we can still change. Mm -hmm. we, can, we can see things differently. And I really think fiction in their, in its sly, you mm -hmm. know, elusive way, yeah. has a big, big role in this. Yeah. yeah. I love sly fiction. What, <laughs> what questions? Anybody have questions for Joy? Okay. Can I ask a question about Harold? Is that what it's called? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, and sorry, um, the standing mics are on both ends. Do you mind just repeating that question? I'm sorry. Hi. Is this on? Yeah. Yeah? Um, I wondered if you could talk about alternating between first and third person, both in Harrow and in State of Grace. Is that a, why, why does that form come naturally to you? It seems to come naturally. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong, but... <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, it's wonderful when things come naturally, but I don't kind of understand it, actually. What I do, it's just the needs of the moment. And I, uh, I think my, my husband, Rust Hills, always was so big on point of view, POV, POV. I never kind of comprehended it, you know? I mean, I was really dumb in this regard. I didn't know why it had to be consistent. I, I didn't know the rules. So uh, I just, uh, I guess I do you know, what the occasion arises and, oh, well, you, clearly this has to be told from <laughs> a different point of view. <laughs> and uh, I just do it. Do, do you find that, is it bumpy or? No. no? Yeah, yeah. No. So what do you tell students oh. when you're on the <laughs> point of view? 
chapter, like the day that you're teaching. We don't have a point of view uh, day. <laughs> okay. No, that's not okay. it. <laughs> yeah. Or character or setting. Right, right. Or voice, this so. is good. This is not so good. This <laughs> is like. <laughs> yeah. um, any other questions? Joy Williams fans? Yeah. Can I just speak up? Is you can speak Yes, up. you have a, yes. That, yes. <laughs> so I have four observations, um, in, in a way, invitations to you to tell us a little bit more. The first was, um, I, I, I deeply enjoyed and was very impressed by your piece, let's call it not the manifesto, but what you... <laughs> right. so the non-manifesto. You crafted and composed, and uh, I could sense the... Should you want to answer that part is first? That, is that a, a good way that we go? Yeah, I think it might be. Rather than me offloading this and then you, what was your second point? What was your, so, <laughs> what, Joseph Brodsky and this non-human... Oh, oh, you know, and I don't know what's around that line. I mean, I'm not uh, super familiar with Brodsky, but if the truth of the world exists, it's got to be non-human. That's the kind of sentence or, or phrase or challenge that really, what, what, what could that possibly mean? And that is what we need more of. I mean, the exercise in the mind. And uh, that. I just, I just love that line. And I don't know what he means by it, but it's, there's, there's truth to it. Of course it's the truth. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yes, yes. Oh. Wherever, wherever Brodsky gets it from and whatever he's yeah. insinuating, it's what it does. Uh, then then uh, I was struck, this is me simply listening to you, I didn't take notes. <laughs> uh, I, 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 I was struck uh, almost at quantum level uh, when you said a, a metaphysical disruption. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> it's there, right? In other words, yeah, yeah. So, where tell us more about it? What, what, what is it? Is it? I mean, of course, it's linked to that Brodsky thing in one way or another. But, but I'm about how the metaphysical disruption should yeah, take place, or does? Uh -huh. I think you said in the in the talk that the fiction can be metaphysically disruptive in a way mm -hmm. that other arts maybe aren't as. Yeah. Uh, is that what you you're yes, thinking that mu No, but I mean you're thinking that maybe music that's a false statement that maybe music can be or, or uh, more metaphysically disruptive than fiction. Well, that's yeah, yes. That's an interesting. Yes, point. yeah, yeah. No, I want uh, fiction's got to step up. I mean, I, I you know, I do think that music does work in the way that I I don't want fiction to be working, it, and uh, that's what I mean by that. But I, I like your, you know, focusing on on Brodsky because I think that is such a strange line. What could it possibly? This is how we should begin thinking. This is how we should begin reading. This is how we should what we should demand more of what we're reading and how it affects us in the world. Um, that's Great work, big challenge. Part three. But thank you very much for liking the piece. Oh, uh, there has to be a third one, I guess. <laughs> is, is, is this fun? <laughs> if it's fun, it's okay. Uh, now the third uh, one. Uh, 114 years ago, uh, a, a poet that is unfortunately not an American poet, but still an important uh, writer, Yes, yes, yes. Du musst dein Leben ändern, was the original line. His name was Anna Maria Rilke. Of 
course. And it has been one of those lines. You need to change your life. We've been giving that message. So been given that message. I know. And so I'm wondering, just if you take that. Now, of course, he's not in fiction. He was into poetry. Mm -hmm. So there's a double question or invitation to you. You, as the master short storyteller, the tinkering and experimenting with novel that you don't know what the rules are, it's a wonderful stuff. I love all of that. <laughs> I think, I mean, not everybody's wild about my short stories. <laughs> I mean, I think, and I've been writing them for years and years and years. But I think some people f thought they were cold, that they weren't uh, seriously addressing the agonies of the human heart. So I guess with the characters that I've made in all these years and all those stories, they're, they're seekers, they're, they're befuddled, they're qu constantly questioning, they're kind of, si sometimes they're silly, sometimes they're not very pleasant, but they constantly are wondering and are restless. And uh, so in a way, I, th I think that's how I, you must change your life. They all want to change their life and they, uh, and they, they, they can't, and they're perceived as sort of odd by, uh, the other characters in the story, or by the reader, even sometimes, and this is not, no. They're they're seekers. There's not enough of 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 seeking and wondering and amazement, I think, in 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 fiction. And so even I mean, that's a slanty in a, in a modest way of approaching this, but maybe that's it. Just awake, awake, right? Uh, change your life. Pay attention. Any other questions for Joy? Yeah. Hi, thank Hi. you. This will not be four parts. Uh, but I was just wondering, um, I'm sorry. That's do you find funny. it difficult to reconcile this um, work that we need to do to deconstruct these systems in order to kind of avert or assuage the climate catastrophe with um, you having to participate in them to kind of get your message across in terms of like specifically capitalism as an author, you have to work in these publishing spheres and publish these books and encourage people to buy them when we should be kind of degrowing that um, in general. Do you find there's a tension there or that's difficult I'm for sorry, you? The tension, be the tension between, you know, why my lifestyle or, you know, that I, or something, well, I drive it, a it, truck. It, let me see if I, <laughs> yeah. if, yeah, if sorry. fiction, um, you know, if the kind of fiction that you're encouraging in your talk tonight in, is the kind of fiction that encourages, um, you know, readers to uh, rethink the systems that we live in, including capitalism, does it feel wrong to you somehow that you have to participate in that system to sell books and to get paid to write oh. books? Is oh, that, wow. Okay. Oh, gosh. I mean, <laughs> you mean the trees and the pages and the, yeah, 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 yeah. I think that's just a, 
a false trail that is being perpetuated on people who do want to change. I mean, that challenge, well, you know, you had a baby or, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're driving a non-electric car. And please, don't get me started, non-electric cars. Uh, but no, I, th I think that's, they want to set up that dynamic. You're part of it by, you know, uh, writing books or uh, traveling to uh, uh, readings and stuff. That's not, that's not the problem. I mean, I, it's, a, it's a, just a different wave. What you think, you're, you're, you're thinking there's another way of injecting us with this change uh, that uh, is outside of fiction or the old ways of reading books. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, not yet. <laughs> Thank you. Question? Okay. So I was curious. So from listening to you speak, I think you, I understand your pl primary philosophy in writing and art in general in that you want to challenge readers to try to think about ideas. You want to bring them out of their comfort zone and to, you want them to think basically. So my question is, in your art, you want people to think about things. Do you put kind of answers in, if that makes sense? Like, for example, if you're discussing something, I don't know, where you're talking about climate, do you try to, do you try to move readers in the direction that you think is correct? Or do you want to completely leave out the answers altogether? No, I, I think that's a very good question, and I don't know if I can, but uh, no, as I said, the message is not, uh, you, you can't guide them that way, but there must be something, I think, so startling in the construct, in the prose, in what these people are doing or thinking. It's just, you know, if, if truth exists, it's got to be non-human, I mean, boom, you know? That's how it should be, instead of, that's the problem, I think, now, there's still, it's, this is the good work that you have to do. It, it has to be a totally different way of, of delivery, of, of writing. Uh, but that's, that's a very interesting, because no, I, I don't think the, the answer lies in the message. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? If not, Joy's um, sign, signed copies of Harrow are available in the library gift shop. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, much for being here, Thank and uh, thanks, Joy. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.